So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by Corey Kupfer, who is the principal of Kupfer and Associates. And Corey's actually joining us from New York this morning. So good afternoon to you, but good morning for us. Lovely to have you here. Lovely to be with you. So just looking here, so, so but, um, Corey is an expert strategist. He's a deal maker. He's an attorney. He's a consultant. He's told me he's very happily married, about to celebrate his twentieth wedding anniversary, and he's also an author and a speaker and, and around negotiating. So we're going to have some real fun talking about this this morning. But before we get started, Corey, I always love to share with our listeners a professional and a personal best and a bit of your story, if you don't mind. Yeah, you know, I, listen, I grew up as a lower middle class kid in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we were never poor, but we had, you know, uh, it was sort of paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you know, my, 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 not many people in my family went on to higher education. Um, you know, my, my father actually did for 14 years at night, you know, uh, while he was working, finally got his college degree. Um, but, you know, I was sort of the first professional in the family and uh, uh, sought out in big law in, in, in New York, but always wanted, always knew I didn't want to work for somebody for the rest of my life. I've been running businesses uh, since I was young. I had a business at 15 to learn flyers door to door and hired my friends to work for me. Um, so, uh, you know, I always had this entrepreneurial bent and, and um, you know, after uh, a little, about six years of, uh, of practice, I got a shingle. I had no clients. Um, it was a recession. I paid my rent on credit cards, did everything you weren't supposed to do. And somehow, you know, I'm still standing uh, 30 years later and have, uh, Fortunately, built a, a very successful law firm and consulting practice and speaking business. So, uh, yeah, it's been a long way from uh, that low middle class kid in Brooklyn, New York. Fantastic. <laughs> so along that journey, what are the things you've been most proud of? Yeah, you know, for me, it's always, uh, you know, I think I got to a place earlier on than some people who get there later around having it be like driven by impact. You know, uh, and listen, I don't want to make it sound like I like making money. I like being able to travel and live in good places and whatever. Don't get me wrong. I'm not some sort of monk. Um, <laughs> having said that, though, what juices me up is the impact. You know, I work with entrepreneurial companies to help them grow and, you know, people from startup all the way through exit. And it's the kind of stuff of having people helping entrepreneurs pursue their dreams and manifest that. I've got somebody now who I started representing 23 years ago help him start. He's about to sell his company. So I've been along for that journey the entire time. That gives me a lot of um, satisfaction. And then also I have various causes and things that I you know, believe in and I'm involved in and having the freedom of, you know, having built my firm the way I do and having a great team has really allowed me to pursue some of the, you know, those things that also make an impact. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's the stuff I'm most proud of. And we talked a little bit before the podcast and you were saying that actually you went all fully online back in 2015, which is well ahead of the curve of most businesses, but even more so for lawyers, right? I assume that that's not a normal thing for a lawyer firm. No question. That's for sure. And it's funny because I say to people, and it's true, I don't think most of my success has come because I'm particularly like ahead of the curve or, you know, uh, you know, knowing the future. Most of my success has come from just building great relationships and doing great work and, you know, caring about people. But um, I split up a partnership in 2015. And um, whereas for most of my career, I knew you always, you were meeting with people in person and, and, you know, prospects, certainly you wouldn't get a big client. I started noticing that I was getting clients referred to me and, and, you know, the world was changing. Obviously I had more of a reputation that was built in trust and referral sources, but also the world was changing. And not only did people not have to meet with you, but they really didn't want to take the time uh, to meet. So um, just, I, I had that instinct and then I had my assistant do a, uh, analysis of my calendar for three years going back just mm -hmm. to back that up and figure you know, figured out that it was right, that we were never meeting with people anymore, hardly. So in May of 2015, when I reestablished my, I had my own firm for many, many years, went into a partnership and then, um, split out of the partnership. And when I reestablished my own firm, uh, knowing also that I was getting a place in Southern California soon, and I was going to be by coastal and not always in the office. Um, I set it up where we were set up to operate fully virtually, like the way a lot of people have moved since the pandemic. You know, mm -hmm. we were using obviously conference lines, Zoom back then, um, you know, even everything's in the cloud, you know, and, um, and we were working fully remotely um, since 2015. So that was a blessing when the pandemic hit. Um, first of all, it was a blessing because, I mean, the firm profitability is great when you don't have, especially Manhattan New York, Manhattan, right overhead. Of course. Um, and, then, and then, you know, when the pandemic hit, we, we just didn't miss it. We literally did not have to change a single thing we were doing. We had no adjustment whatsoever. So mm. we were very blessed in that way. 
Yeah, no, I can't can't imagine that because we had to make some significant changes. I'm afraid we weren't that we weren't that far ahead, sadly. But yeah, <laughs> that's great. So we're talking about negotiating today, and and obviously the, the thing that usually comes to mind is M and A, right? So that's people think well with grow, growing businesses, that's what it is all about, and that's when you get a lawyer involved. But it's a lot more than that, isn't it? The sort of deals that you do are uh, across a, a broad range of services, right? Yeah. So so in terms of the deals that we help people do, and you know. If, my old philosophy, it's, it's, it's what we work on with people in the law practice. It's what my DealQuest podcast is all about. It's, hey, listen, if you're a successful business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, um, you have probably figured out, at least to some extent, how you get customers and clients organically, right? Sales and marketing, providing great products and services. You need to do that. You couldn't be in business if you did. Mm-hmm. But maybe you're at a place where you're not growing or you're, or you're frustrated that your growth rate isn't what it should be or what you'd like it to be. And if you study any uh, most companies that grow significantly. And I'm not even talking about the unicorns, the high tech. I'm just talking about, you know, regular growth companies funded or not. Um, you find that they do it with a combination of organic growth, right? Sales and marketing and inorganic deal driven growth of some sort. Yep. And there's a lot of myths out of there, you know, that, oh, it's only for big companies or funded companies. No, there are strategic alliances, joint ventures, um, you know, distribution agreements, marketing agreements, online affiliate deals. There's a million types of deals that you can do. So those are the kind of things we generally negotiate. But my negotiating book, Authentic Negotiating, actually has negotiating principles that apply to all of that. And a lot of the examples of those kind of things. But frankly, you can apply those principles to negotiating your home purchase, negotiating, you know, I, I joke probably the toughest uh, negotiations with like your teenage kids. You know, you can even use it for that. <laughs> So um, your book, Authentic Negotiation, tell me a little bit about, you know, what is the, the basis for the book and what are the things that we could take from that and use in our, maybe looking after our teenagers or with our strategic alliances? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, first of all, the, the book takes a very different approach because what, what I found out there, there's a lot of negotiating books that are all about tactics and counter tactics, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if they do this, then you do that. And then if they do that, you do this, right? And I'm not saying there isn't some good work out there that gives you some strategic and tactical level uh, positive things, but there's also a lot of manipulation, you know, out there, a lot of bad actually advice out there, mm-hmm. right? Things that are missed, things that don't make sense. Um, but even with the good stuff that's on a tactical level, my argument, and this is true for everything for me, for success in business, whatever, is that there's a body of internal work. There's, there's something beyond the tactical, right? Because here's the thing, if you come into a negotiation in a place of scarcity, in a place of not feeling that that you're worth it, uh, in in a place of fear, and we can go on and on, right, from a rigid place, I don't care what tactics you put on top of that, you're not going to be successful, Mm -hmm. right? That body of, my my work is about this body of work to do, to get in that place, and and I always say, no matter what tactics you use, if you study what I teach, I think you're going to be better than 80 and 90% of the negotiators out there, because, they may be working tactically, but they're not working on, listen, I can sense when somebody comes in and is desperate for a deal. I don't care. And I can also read every tactic they're doing because, you know, I've seen it all for 30 years. Yeah. So I have a fundamental framework that I can talk about if you want, that's based upon three letters, C, D, E, that if you master uh, can, can make all the difference in negotiation. Sure. I'd love to hear what C, D, E stands for. <laughs> sure. So uh, the C stands for clarity, Right. So the first thing to do in a negotiation, and listen, if, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, high powered executive, whatever, we're all busy. So, and, and we also often pride ourselves on being able to shoot from the hip and wing it and be good on our feet, right? <laughs> yes. Which is great. And sometimes it's, I mean, it's a hugely good skill to have. And also it can come to haunt us, you know, in a big negotiation, lack of preparation and not getting that clarity that you need. And there's two elements of clarity. One is just doing the external research, right? What mm-hmm. is the market like? You know, what, what are valuations? What are royalty rates on that licensing deal? Whatever it is, right? Um, doing research on your counterparty, right? What are their goals? What are their interests? What does that particular negotiator want? Do they have a budget to meet? People skimp there, but where they really skimp is the internal body of work, okay? What, what is it that I'm, re- why am I doing this deal in the first place? What is it that I really want to get out of it? Can I write down a very specific list of objectives, of outcomes that I want out of this negotiation so that when things get emotional, because they do, right, mm-hmm. especially with important negotiation, I can true myself back up and it becomes binary, right? And I'm not talking about rigid. I'll, I can make a distinction there. 
But you're very, very clear on the outcomes you want. If the deal can get you those outcomes, right, then you do it. If the deal doesn't reach those outcomes, you don't, right? It doesn't mean if I'm negotiating a deal with Deborah, it doesn't mean Deborah's a horrible person or she's a jerk or whatever because we can't get a deal done. It just means her objectives in this moment and my objectives in this moment don't meet. And I got to trust that I'm not meant to do that deal right now. Maybe we'll do a deal later. Maybe we'll never do a deal. Maybe there's a better deal coming along. So I do multi-million dollar deals sometimes where people don't have that level of clarity. And then the problem is when you get into the negotiation, you have no ground, you have no basis to go for, right? And it's so easy to get thrown off and end up either doing a bad deal or killing a deal because you would get emotionally you know, involved in something and you have nothing to go back to. So clarity is the first point, that's the C. Mm, excellent. And that kind of um, applies to almost all meetings that we hold too, right? Because I, I'm always absolutely yeah. gobsmacked when you go into meetings and you actually come out of it and go, what was the objective for that meeting? It's like, oh, well, we were just having a meeting. No, there must've been something you wanted out of it. So it's something that I teach my clients around, you know, making sure every meeting has got some clear agenda objective, knowing what you want from it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's, you know, and, and it's crucial in, 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 in negotiations. And it's also crucial in every negotiating session, every meeting mm-hmm. that you have specific objectives that are for that particular negotiating session that may be a subset of the larger objectives. Perfect. OK, so the D, what's the D? So the D is detachment. And this is the one that a lot of people have the most trouble with, right? Is the ability to stay detached from the outcome. And detachment doesn't mean, I've been told that, that the Buddhists, not that I'm an expert in this, use the word unattached because they see detached as not caring. I don't mean it that way. I mean, I mean you care, but, but you're the best negotiators I've ever seen. And I've got to study a lot of them because I, you know, uh, I've done this over 35 years. Um, they, will, they will ultimately... Again, if I'm negotiating a deal with Deborah, I should have a preference that you and I get a deal done, right? Because why would I be wasting my time unless I had a preference? But ultimately, we're going to do a deal. We're not going to do a deal. And that needs to be equally okay with me because I trust if we don't do a deal, that's what's meant to be, right? And a lot of people say this in the way of, oh, you always got to be able to be willing to walk away. And that's true. But here's the big difference. Too many people walk away from upset, anger, ego, frustration, whatever it is, right? That's not what I'm talking about here because that could be something that just triggered you. That's not from a place of clarity. When you, when you are detached, if you need to walk away, you don't walk away with any of those motions. You walk away from a place of getting connected to the clarity and understanding that this deal will not meet those objectives. And okay, it's not meant to be. We'll move on. Love it. Yeah, that's very cool. Okay, so then the E, what is the final one? So the E is equilibrium. So now we get into the, let's say we've done, our, we've done our work. We've done a great job. We've done the external, the internal, internal work. We've gotten our clarity. We go in, we understand, we're gonna stay detached. And now we're in that negotiation. And the person on the other side says, your company's not worth half that. Or, you know, I would never pay you that much for that project. Or, you know, we bring so much more to the table on this joint venture that you, whatever it is, right? And what happens? We're human. We get triggered. An emotion comes up. Right. Maybe. And, you know, it could be as simple as we just get annoyed because we disagree with the point. It could trigger something from, you know, deep inside of us about our value, our worth, our, you know, uh, being seen, whatever it is. And what happens? We get thrown off. We lose our equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So now we lose connection to it. We're no longer detached. We came in thinking we'd be detached and we and we lose connection to our clarity. So a lot of what I teach in the book. And I've got a whole uh, tool that I give called CPR, which we, we may not have time to cover, but it's in the book. Um, and other ways is, okay, how do you get clear? How do you stay detached? But then in the negotiation, what are some of the specific things you can do that maintain that equilibrium so that you maintain your clarity and detachment and end up in the right place? Mm, that sounds great. So tell me about the sort of pitfalls, the things that you've seen people you know, fall into that have stalled negotiation or even, um, you know, made it impossible to reach a, a, a satisfactory conclusion for the objectives. <laughs> yeah, you know, I talk, in the book, I talk about um, the top six re- reasons negotiating, negotiations fail. Right. And really, most of the time they come down to some sort of emotion, right? It's fear, it's rigidity, it's, you know, it's, it's these things that come up in us where, because keep in mind, I don't consider it a failed negotiation 
if you do not get a deal done from a place of clarity CDA, right? Clarity International Legal. That's not mm -hmm. a fail. That's actually a success because what it means is that you avoided, because listen, there's, no, there's only one thing that's worth, worse than not getting a deal done and that's doing a bad deal, right? <laughs> and if you leave a negotiation from a place of clarity, you've avoided doing a bad deal and that's, and that's a great thing, right? Mm -hmm. You get to, because bad deals are, you know, are, worth, are, are terrible. So, um, so the key is not to get triggered, right? If you're coming in, I talk all about fear. I talk about, you know, not owning your value. I talk about being rigid in a negotiation. I talk about a lot of these things, not lack of preparation is a big one, which ties into the clarity. A lot of them, which is why I always say it comes back to this internal body of work, right? Um, so, you know, example, and listen, I don't, I don't like to make gender-based statements because they're not always true and it's a stereotype or whatever, but I will tell you, and I've spoken to many, many, female negotiating experts and who agree with me 100% here. In general, not across the board, but in general, men tend to blow negotiations because of, the, because of ego, right? <laughs> yep. They get, you know, they, they get annoyed, they get pissed off, they get whatever, they get like, you know, whatever, all right? Women, the biggest uh, issue women have uh, in general is not owning the value. There's so much in this society uh, you know, whether it's upbringing, whether it's advertising, whatever that, that you know, we can get into, we can spend hours on this topic. Um, that does it for people in general, right? Like you're not good enough unless you drive this car or wear this makeup or, you know, mm -hmm. but it's so much more so for, for women. And the biggest um, um, shifts in, in, in success in negotiations I've seen is for men to be able to breathe and not get triggered and not get their ego engaged. And it's for women to work on owning, owning their value and being able to, you know, there's all kinds of studies on women don't ask for raises as often, which is part of the reason for the pay gap, you know, and, and there's a lot of things involved in that. Again, we can spend hours on it, but, um, and I don't want to oversimplify this, but, you know, if you want to, those are the two big points on how generally women and men blow negotiations. And I've got to be honest, I've observed the same thing in my own practice as well. I mean, I think that females in general, you know, I, I've had to work very hard myself on myself to ensure that I actually own that value because I think it's a, it's an inherent thing that goes back to the way that we nurture and whatnot is this, I don't know, I don't know, I can't explain, I'm not a psychologist, but I certainly have seen it. So tell me, I'm interested with the whole triggering thing, because I've done a lot of work around self-development and I help people with, you know, with when they do get triggered, what do you sort of recommend? How do you first of all recognize that you're triggered? Um, and then yeah. what can you do to, to bring yourself back to a connection? Yeah, so, so I'll answer that in a couple of ways. So there's some things you can do before the negotiation to prep to make it more, less likely that, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the first thing I always say to people is, listen, what do you do in any situation in life to get yourself calmed down and reconnected, right? For some folks, that's meditation or prayer. For some people, people it's going out for a run. For some people, it's, 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 you know, calling a friend and bouncing things off and talking it out. Uh, for some people who are more analytical, it's, you know, creating a spreadsheet with the pluses and negatives of a particular situation, right? So the first thing I always say is, listen, know yourself. What do you do in general in life to get yourself connected and, you know, reconnected and clear and grounded, right? Mm -hmm. So do that. Um, the next thing I always say is that, remember, when you're in a negotiation itself, okay, you don't, you can take, I mean, just taking a break is this is sometimes the single most you know um, best tactic, right? If you feel an emotion coming up, if you feel yourself getting triggered, right? Maybe it's a lunch break time. Maybe you just need to go to the bathroom, or you want to step out. You got to take a phone call. Whatever it is, just remove yourself from that situation and give you space. Breathing is also you know another good thing. And then um, finally, uh, you know, I do have this particular tool in the book: context, purpose, and results where you, it's a, it's a way you get clarity. It's a way, and, 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 and you actually write it down. You have it in, you memorize your context and your purpose, and then you have it with you also write, in writing. And this is sort of a touchstone that you can go back to, right? And, and a, a quick, you know, I mean, listen, Simon Sinek, you know, and others have talked about your wife. We don't know the wife. We don't know the purpose of what we're in the negotiations for. It's easy to get thrown off. And then very quickly, context is the being part. Is who do I need to be to control to uh, have that purpose be achieved, right? Mm. You know, and, 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 and certainly nobody's going to say I need to be a, you know, um, scared or, you know, desperate or whatever, right? You know, I need to be patient, I need to be calm, I need to be whatever it is. So you've created that context and that particular tool is something that you can go back to, you can take that break, you can look at your CPR. So that's described more in the authentic negotiating book. Um, but it, it, one of the things I always say is this, I'm not advocating being a robot, we're human. 
emotions are going to come up. The difference is this. Are the emotions going to be a signal to you, a sign that you're going to take the time to evaluate why they're coming up and be self-aware enough to know, oh, wait a second, I think just my ego's getting triggered here. I'm not, like, I don't want to blow the deal off of that. Or, you know, maybe you have this gut feeling you can't even put something on, but something doesn't feel right and you trust it, right? So the difference is, are the emotions going to be a signal to you or they are they going to control what you do? Yeah. We don't want them to control what you do. We want them to be information that has you come in and whether it's recognizing that or using my CPR tool, you want to be able to say to yourself, this is a question I often say to people, take a moment and say to yourself, is the next thing I'm going to say or do move me, going to move me closer to my purpose, closer to achieving those objectives I got clear on or further away? And if you take that moment to ask that question, often you'll get clarity on whether you know, you're just reacting in a way that's um, useful or not useful. You're checking on your feelings to see if they're actually yeah, being driven by being triggered or if there's actually something genuine there that you need to be aware of and go back to what that sort of that, yeah, sort of the context, the purpose, the results, what you're actually wanting to achieve out of it. And are you going further towards it or is it taking you backwards? How do you um, end you know, a negotiation where it becomes obvious that you actually are not going to be on the same page? It's not going to be a win-win. Is there a, a nice way to sort of, you know, bring that to an end? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, this this may be, you know, counterintuitive to what a lot of people would do, but I think if you think about it, it really makes sense. I mean, listen, I tend to, it's, it's sort of what I said to you before in the example. I said, you know, hey, if Deborah and I are negotiating a deal and, you know, we, we you know, it's not going to work out, I, you know, it's not because Deborah's a jerk or whatever, it's because your so her objective is my objective, so me, right? And that's a very easy way to say it. You know, you can, uh, you can acknowledge, I mean, acknowledgement goes a long way, right? I have said to mm-hmm. folks, listen, Listen, I hear you. I acknowledge that these things are important to you, right? They just don't work for us or for my client or whatever it is, right? No right or wrong here, right? You, you need X, my client can't provide X, or you need it to be Y, and my client, Y doesn't work for my client right now. So I don't think it's the time, you know, I, I think it probably makes sense for both of us not to spend a lot more time right now negotiating this deal, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, we should leave the communications line up, lines open, but I don't think the objective is me right now, uh, you know, so there's nothing wrong with anything. No, that's actually perfect, yeah. <laughs> hey, one of the things I was really keen to kind of uh, explore a little bit was around the strategic alliances or strategic relationships, um, because I know a lot of this stuff gets done by, you know, a shake of the hand or, or a, a just a, a quick verbal agreement. Again, what are the sort of the, the things that you should be aware of if you're going to look at a strategic alliance or partnership? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I want to say is that strategic alliances, partnerships, joint ventures, whatever, you, you know, however the structure mm-hmm. is such an important and often underutilized tool. Um, for folks, right? You know, I often ask people, they say, oh, Corey, I've been trying to get into this market. I can't get in there. Or, you know, we're, we have this new product we're trying to sell. Or, we, you know, and I always say to them, well, who, who's in that market already? Have you thought about partnering with them? So I just want to say that. I know it's a, you know, because it, there's so many times that simple question to folks to say, have you thought about who you might be able to partner with or a lot, have an alliance with? And they haven't. So just one, I want to highlight asking that question. Mm-hmm. Two, um, once you do that, yes. I mean, listen, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually a lawyer who believes that ultimately deals work or don't work because of relationship and trust. And, and having said that anyway, it is super crucial to document your relationship. Okay. Now, a lot of people think about the reason to document it. You know, there's two major reasons. A lot of people think about one of them, when they, especially when they think about lawyers, which is if something goes wrong, if something goes bad or whatever, right? Who has rights? Who has, you know, who, who can enforce what against who? And that's important. But the other one that's underestimated by a lot of business folks is this. The process of going through creating the written agreement helps what lawyers call uh, a meeting of the minds. Hmm. But more importantly, from a business level, I've seen too many situations where it's not even somebody turns out to be a bad person, right? Or, but it's just an honest misunderstanding of the level of time or duties or services or who was going to do what or how in this particular situation, the money was going to be split or whatever it is. And it's easy for that to happen when it's not in writing. The process of putting an agreement in writing forces that to get clarity mm-hmm. on what the deal is. 
And also to think through some issues you just might not have covered, right? You may have very well covered, okay, you're going to do X, I'm going to do Y, this is going to do it, right? But the, some of the eventualities of what happens if this happens, that happens, only come out when you go through the process of, of writing agreements. So what it does is it gets that clarity and actually increases the chances of that relationship working out, not because there's a piece of paper necessarily, because if somebody's a bad person or you don't gel, it's not going to work out anyway. But it does two things. One, it helps make sure that there's no honest disagreements. You get aligned, you get the same vision. And two, if there are disagreements, actually the process of going through the writing will bring them out earlier so that maybe you'll say, wait a second, this is maybe not the right deal to do, mm-hmm. right? And you didn't, wouldn't have had that opportunity. You would have found that out much later when it cost you a lot more than earlier by going through the written agreement process. I think as humans, we actually like to have boundaries as well. And so it does help to sort of clarify what those boundaries are that we're going to work within. And I think that you're right, the whole core values piece. Now, are we actually on the same page in terms of our our core values and beliefs? And I liken it to a relationship or a marriage. You know, you don't go into marrying somebody without having the conversations around, do you want children? Where do you want to live? What are your plans for the future? You know, having those those, um, understanding of whether or not you're on the same page. Um, And if you don't do that, then often those relationships don't work out. (laughs) Well, that's right. And, and, you know, and shockingly, some people, even in marriages, don't, don't have a comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, honestly, this, is, this has been fascinating. I, I'm loving um, everything about this. So we've, we've covered off CDE. We've covered off CPR. So you've given some really good tips on those so far. Um, just in terms of finishing off, because we're sadly running out of time, what would be the three kind of top tips that you would give to people or a book? Obviously, the book, they should read your book, um, Authentic Negotiation. But, you know, what are the things you'd like to share with the listeners about what they could do from your experiences as a business owner and also as a obviously an expert negotiator? Yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, I, I gave the, you know, more of the specific negotiating tips. So I think I'm going to talk about things that are a little more general here. Yeah. Um, so, so, so one is um, because doing deals in negotiating takes effort and time, right? Mm-hmm. You, to do it really successfully, um, you need to be in a position where you've created a business, right? And this is a part of what you help people with right? That's not fully dependent upon you. I mean, you know, if you're in the business running the day to day, then your ability to be freed up and look at for deal opportunities and, 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 and even take that time to negotiate, right, is going to be, is going to be limited. So, um, so actually, you know, organic growth helps actually fuel inorganic deal driven growth, which then helps, you know, it's, so it could be a very virtuous positive circle if you do it right. So, you know, for me, that whole working on your business, not in your business. Um, I'm a big believer in this concept of highest and best use, yeah. right? I, I work to um, only, do, so the highest and best use for me is, is three things. One, it's stuff you love to do, but that's not enough because, um, you know, you. I, I'm sorry, the first one is it's stuff you're great at, right? You're really good at. That's not enough because if you hate it, you still should get someone else to, to do it. So you got to love doing it. And a lot of people stop there on, you know, the fact that they, they, they great at it and they love it. But especially if you are the owner of the business, and you know, partner, uh, executive, it also has to have leverage. It has to move the needle. It has to make a difference, mm-hmm. right? So it's got to be those three things and everything else you delegate. Well, doing deals and negotiating may be one of those things for you. If it's not, you need to find somebody to come in. So that's, so that's, that, that would be my first big tip is just, you know, you know it's just create a business where, um, you know, you, you build a freed up, be freed up to do that. The yeah. second thing is for me, and I alluded to it, and it applies to negotiating and it applies to business growth. I believe that our businesses can only be as successful as our own personal growth <laughs> allows. Okay. Especially as an entrepreneur, right? Because, you know, it, it, we, if we hit a limit on whether it's a relationship to money, what we think we deserve, um, how much we can trust other people to be able to build a team and delegate all of these things, right? Our business is going to suffer. And, and, and we could go to, and with, 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 all respect to what Deborah does, which is phenomenal, right? I don't care what system you have in place, what operating system, what whatever, right? If if you are in a place where you're going to sabotage things or you're not willing to grow to be able to be that kind of leader, right? You know, it's not going to work. So for me, uh, personal growth and internal work, self-awareness is so crucial for business owners and executives. And if you're not willing to do that work, you're going to cap out. Um, so that's... Uh, that's my other big one. And then the final one I'll say is, is this. 
Um, I, I'm always amazed. I've seen so many, you know, there's this distinction that some people make with judgment sometimes about the difference between an entrepreneur and a business owner. You know, somebody's bought themselves a job and it could be very judgmental. I don't care. And, you know, people put down lifestyle businesses, whatever. I don't have any of that judgment going on. I want you and me and Deborah and everybody to have whatever business they want to have and life they want to have. Where I do get concerned or, or is where people go out, create a business, and then, you know, they, they have no, you know, their, their relationships are still messed up, their health is terrible, they, they don't have time to take time or whatever. And, and I always wonder why, you know, why, why are we doing that, right? Mm-hmm. For me, our businesses, the opportunity in life is for our businesses to create the life we want. So one of the things I often say is that actually every business should be a lifestyle business. Now, maybe for some of you, that lifestyle you want is to build the next Facebook or Tesla or, you know, build that unicorn and raise venture capital and be traveling all over the world. And if that's you, what you want, that's a great lifestyle. Mm-hmm. If you want to have a, you know, solo uh, preneur business where, you know, you have a certain small number of clients, you make a very nice living, you don't have a lot of pressure, and that's what you want. That's great as well, right? The business should be designed for the life we want, because if we're not creating the life we want, why are we in business? <laughs> we are so on the same page. I think that's why you sort of um, offered to be on the podcast. I think so having read what my beliefs are as well. It's all about having the best possible life, which comes from having a better business, a business that actually meets your personal needs as well. Cool. Hey, um, if people wanted to get hold of your book um, or find out more about what you do, where, where would they do that, Corey? So the, the, the best single hub is coreycupfer.com. That's C-O-R-E-Y-K-U-P-F-E-R.com. Uh, you can get to my law firm from there, which is cupforlaw.com. You can get to information on my book. You can get information on my Deal Quest podcast. That's sort of our hub website. I'm also active on LinkedIn and other social media, but coreycupper.com, you'll be able to find anything <laughs> that I'm involved in. That is fantastic. Hey, look, I wanted to say a huge thanks for your time. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I always sort of worry when you're talking to a lawyer, it might be a bit boring, but I can honestly say, hand on heart, that was a lot of fun. So thank you. <laughs> and some really great tips there that people can put in place, you know, like the, the CDE and the CPR. So thank you so much for sharing that. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate being able to talk to your audience and hopefully bring some value. Oh, thank you very much. Look forward to talking again soon. Thank you.